Welcome to our November TMIT National Research Testbed High Performer Webinar. Uh, it's terrific to have you all with us today. And I'd just like to cover just a, a, a few housekeeping details uh, to begin with, and that, that is to make sure that all of you are turning up your volume to the highest level on your computers so that you can uh, uh, hear everything that, that we have to share with you today with these great speakers that I'll introduce shortly. I'm on slide four and just describing what you can do if you do not have good audio and you can't hear me very well, you can click on the icon in the lower left corner of your screen uh, of a telephone and then that way we can give you a, a hard line. On slide five, just like to remind those who do not have slides that you can go to safetyleaders.org, www.safetyleaders.org, and in the upper right quadrant of the landing page, click on uh, what's new upcoming events and you can then click on a link that will take you uh, to uh, a place on our website where you can download the slides. I'd like to remind everybody that has the slides to come back to this page, which is slide six, uh, and we'll have more posted videos and audio recordings that you'll hear today, as well as additional resources that we'll be adding. On slide seven, just to remind you, the social media uh, contact uh, uh, information uh, uh, should you want to, uh, to see that. And then on slide eight, our TMIT purpose. Our purpose is that we will measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. Our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that can save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve. And a disclosure statement, which I will not read, is on slide nine, which is up to date for all of the panelists. However, no product or service or technology will be described uh, during this webinar. These are some pretty solid areas, that, uh, but they do not address uh, any product, device, uh, uh, or service. Our speakers and reactors are on slide 10. And we are so blessed to have Clayton Christensen on by audio. And by, however, you'll be able to watch him on video from a recent summit at the University of North Texas Health Science Center, and our, who will be a main speaker by video. And Dan Ford, uh, one of our own, who I'll introduce here shortly, who will be addressing uh, a really challenging area, which is including patients and families and root cause analysis. And we have. Toff Peabody, Dr. Toff Peabody, reacting on audio. He's, he's on an emergency medicine shift this morning uh, in California and will not be able to attend. Dr. Darren D'Agnostino from the University of North Texas Health Science Center. And then we also have patient leader champions in Becky Martin, Sarlene Salamandra, uh, and Jennifer Dingman that will uh, be with us as main reactors to this uh, wonderful topic uh, that Dan will be covering. I'd like to turn it over to Becky Martins, who's going to help uh, set uh, the agenda for us to keep focused on patients and families. Becky? Thank you, Dr. Denham, for inviting me to be part of today's webinar. I'm looking forward to learning more about the innovative strategies to advance patient safety, save money, and most importantly, which save lives. No one wants to see caregiving organizations succeed more than the patients and families that they serve. As much as our health systems strive for perfection, there will be moments, there will be days, when they fall short of being perfect. When there is an unintended outcome at your organization, as Dan Ford will share, an acknowledgement with an invitation for the patient and family to participate in the fact-finding process post-event can be the first of the building blocks for peace and healing for all involved. I'll turn the call back over to you, Dr. Denham. Thanks, Becky. Uh, so what we'd like to do is address what's been in the news and some of the polling highlights from our last webinar uh, in order to kind of set the stage for 2016. And the first, um, the slide uh, number 13 addresses the Institute of Medicine, and it was formerly called the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine report that came out in 2015, and this came out in September, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare. And just to refresh your memories for those of you who have seen it and those that haven't, 
5% of U.S. adults who seek outpatient care experience a diagnostic error. Diagnostic errors contribute to 10% of patient deaths, and diagnostic errors account for 6 to 17% of hospital adverse events. This is a new area that is falling directly in the lap of patient safety and quality officers, and we know that it won't be, it'll only be a matter of time before this is tied to reimbursement. On slide 14, to refresh your memories and draw your attention to the graphic that was, uh, that was used to actually describe the diagnostic process is from that report, and we have that report posted on the page that you went to to register, and you can download the entire report. And I think that the graphic that is portrayed here is one that we'll be emphasizing as we go forward uh, and focus on health information technologies uh, and the critical areas uh, where things break down. The, se the second graphic slide from that report on slide 15 addresses the outcomes from the diagnostic process. And <clears throat> we believe that this is an excellent operational framework or theory or lens through which to examine diagnoses and misdiagnoses. And we'll hear a little bit later from Clayton Christensen how a lens, how a theory may be used as a lens. Just want to draw your attention to an article that came out this week, which is a JAMA article with the lead author, uh, Elizabeth or Beth McLean, uh, who wrote the article uh, years ago regarding how infrequent we actually adopt best practice that's very well substantiated in the literature. And if you remember, she said 50, only 55% of the time, even when there's great evidence, do physicians adopt best and better practice. She's the lead author on a viewpoint response to the, the article or the, the major report to which I uh, uh, referred a little bit earlier. So I draw your attention to it, an excellent article. Um, this is an article on slide 17, which Nancy Conrad, the, for, the, uh, the, the, the wife of the former astronaut, Pete Conrad, who died uh, of, a mis, of, of a misdiagnosis and a systems failure in a small California hospital after a low-speed motorcycle accident, Nancy, as you know, tells her story and has really been focusing on patient safety this morning, sent this, uh, this uh, article to me uh, that showed up in Philadelphia where she is this morning, and it was a jury award of $10.1 million in a misdiagnosis case of a child uh, who had a misdiagnosis of meningitis. So it's only a matter of time that we're going to see an enormous rash of malpractice cases uh, that are going to fall in the laps of risk management. And you, those of you that are safety and quality officers, really need to focus on this uh, because this is going to be, the, the, the burners are going to be turned up on it. I'd like to draw your attention also to an excellent article by Hardeep Singh in the, the British Medical Journal of Quality and Safety um, 2014 September article addressing the frequency of diagnostic errors and estimations. And so uh, the body of literature is growing. Uh, also from Dr. Singh, and this is from last week, uh, November 11th issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, improving diagnosis in healthcare, the next imperative for patient safety. So you have in this set of articles and this report very recent evidence that is going to really tell you that we really need to focus as patient safety and quality officers there. I'll just digress just for a moment to remind you with this slide, slide number uh, 20, uh, the rash of articles that have come out regarding patient safety uh, errors and uh, patient safety issues related to health information technology. I show you this article for those of you that are logging on for the first time. We've shown this in the last couple of webinars and it's a setup for us to look at the patient safety of area of health information technology. And so if we look at this, we see the, uh, the report that came out in 2011 on uh, health information technologies. So in our last webinar, uh, we ask you, or in the last few uh, months, uh, I would like to be involved in providing feedback to health information technology organizations to improve patient safety. And your numbers reflect that you want that uh, our audience, and we have 80,000 in our network, not all 80,000 attend every webinar, uh, but hundreds of organizations do, that 72% affirm that you'd like to be involved with providing feedback to organizations like the Office of the National Coordinator of Healthcare um, uh, Information Technology, with 35% giving it a 10. 
This is the form on slide 23 where you anonymously or by identifying yourself, either way, you could be anonymous or uh, or you can identify yourself, provide input to the Office of the National Coordinator of Information Technology. And so we really encourage you to do that and we'll address more of that in our community of practice. The next question we asked was, I believe we should include patient advocates and consumers as participants in our health information technology community of practice, which Christopher Peabody will lead. And look at what you guys uh, told us. 94% of you believe that patient advocates and consumers, and we say participants, we mean co-leading them, being actively involved in the design, execution, and participation like we are in this webinar today. And fully 60% of you gave it a 10 a very small number were neutral, which was 4%, and only 1% were negative uh, to this. So this told us that you want patients and families to be ad, uh, involved. In our last webinar, we asked, I would like to have the healthcare information technology patient safety community of practice. This is a three webinar series where we're really going to dig into practices that you can implement and organizations you're affiliated with can implement, and we ask, do you want us to start in December or in January? Clearly, you want us to start in January. So we'll do a recap webinar in December, but in January is when we'll launch it, and uh, we wanted to ask you, uh, and we ask you whether you'd like it to be run during our regular time or whether you'd like a separate webinar. We're going to bridge the gap by uh, offering the one in January to be the first community of practice, and then the second and third will be separate from our Thursdays. That way we can get as the biggest audience that we can and actually use it as an on-ramp for those that have missed the work to date when we've been focused on it. So that's enough with our housekeeping details and what's in the news, the articles that I addressed, and the report will be on the website so that you can download them and, uh, and use them for the misdiagnosis, and we'll pull you shortly. I do want to draw your attention to a fabulous patient safety summit. This was focused on leading innovation in patient safety, was led by the University of North Texas Health Science Center, I think one of the new global players in patient safety, who are, uh, who are also founding a patient safety institute focused on innovation. They undertook a wonderful uh, uh, summit in Fort Worth with many of the leading speakers in patient safety and quality, a number of co-authors that you've seen on our webinars and on national uh, from great organizations like the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic and uh, a, a number of other organizations, WHO, uh, and we're all major speakers. The online content from that summit will be available December 12th and we're going to show an excerpt from uh, Dr. Cl uh, Professor Clayton Christensen here shortly uh, to have you uh, uh, understand the concept of disruptive innovation really is a setup to what Dan will be sharing, not that bringing patients into a root cause analysis is a, is a commercial disruptive innovation, but it is a dramatic new way to address a challenging issue to get much more out of what we uh, what we can with our root cause analyses. So I'm going to ask um, uh, I'm going to ask Kyle to play the audio portion of the video. I'll do my best to keep the slides synchronized with uh, Professor Christensen. But if you go to our website at safetyleaders.org, you can watch uh, Professor Cl uh, Christensen, who's such a great communicator on tape. You can actually watch the video. We tried and tested uh, doing it over the WebEx infrastructure. We just couldn't get the speed proper for you. So we're going to play the audio, but you can go back to our website and watch the video. So Kyle, would you please go ahead and start? Professor Christensen is the best-selling author of numerous books including his seminal works, The Innovator's Dilemma, The Innovator's Solution, and Seeing What's Next. Christensen has focused the lens of disruptive innovation on social issues, such as education and healthcare. Disrupting Class looks at the root causes of why schools struggle to offer solutions, and The Innovator's Prescription examines how to fix our healthcare system. On the personal side, he has been an inspiration to leaders all over the world through his writings including his best-selling book, How Will You Measure Your Life? Professor Christensen has been a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and speaks fluent Korean. He has served the Boy Scouts of America for 25 years as a scoutmaster, cubmaster, 
den leader, and PAC chairman. He is the father of five. There could be no better speaker to address leading patient safety innovation than Clayton Christensen, who has suffered from type 1 diabetes, cancer, heart attack, stroke, and pain syndromes related to his treatment. He has suffered preventable adverse drug events with all three of the big three, diabetic agents, anticoagulants, and pain medicines. The theory of disruptive innovation was first coined by Professor Christensen in his research on the disk drive industry popularized in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and its use is credited with helping generate more than $20 billion in new revenue for the Intel Corporation. The theory explains the phenomenon by which an innovation transforms an existing market or sector by introducing simplicity, convenience, accessibility, and affordability where complication and high cost are the status quo. Initially, a disruptive innovation is formed in a niche market that may appear unattractive or inconsequential to industry incumbents, but eventually the new product or idea completely redefines the industry. In the introduction to the innovator's prescription, he defines the three elements necessary for disruptive innovation in healthcare. Number one, technological enabler. Typically, sophisticated technology whose purpose is to simplify, it routinizes the solution to problems that previously required unstructured processes of intuitive experimentation to resolve. Number two, business model innovation. Can profitability deliver these simplified solutions to customers in ways that make them affordable and conveniently accessible? And three, the value network. A commercial infrastructure whose constituent companies have consistently disruptive, mutually reinforcing economic models. In the middle of these three enablers are a host of regulatory reforms and new industry standards that facilitate or lubricate interactions among participants in the new disruptive industry. Interestingly, his disruptive value network design published in 2009, depicting how personal electronic health records and high deductible healthcare plans will evolve with data flow, money flow, and employer contracting is actually happening now in 2015. Clay, we're so excited that you're speaking to this audience. This audience has been convened to focus on leading patient safety and leading innovation in patient safety, your passion. <laughs> I'm just delighted to be with you and with, with your colleagues there. I wish I could be there in person, and I apologize, but this is the next best thing, so thanks. Well, it's great to, to have your book to go by for this group, uh, The Innovator's Prescription. And now five years later, uh, it's amazing how so many of these disruptive innovations are in process. Yeah, I, and that's what we had hoped to do. Um, and we've learned a few things, you know, from the experiences of writing and then uh, teaching about the principles in the book. And a really important one is that if we hope it in any way to change the way our healthcare is delivered, um, we have to have a common language, and we have to have a common way to frame the problem. And if we get there, then we can reach uh, consensus around even counterintuitive courses of action. But if we try to solve the problem without having a common language, we'll just never get there from here. You know, and there are a few ideas and a few uh, pieces of language in the book that I think have you know, moved the, the work ahead. And for that, I'm just very grateful. It's been so wonderful to work with you over the years and have you teach us how to use theory as a lens. Can you describe that for us? Yeah. Well, you know, the word theory gets a bum rap with professionals because it's associated with the word theoretical, which connotes impractical. But any time any of us takes an action, it's predicated upon a theory in our mind that if we do this, we'll get the results we need. Or every time we put together a plan of action, it's predicated upon one or more sets of theories about, because a theory is a statement of causality, of what causes what and why. And so we put together this plan that's predicated upon theories. And, and the nice thing about a theory is we can predict in advance whether our action will get the results that we need. 
And so that's why we focus so much on developing good theories, because we use theories anyway. And gosh, I hope they're good. So Clay, in your book, The Innovator's Prescription, you describe at the outset the theory of disruptive innovation. And it has been much maligned, and it's been much misquoted. And I think you did a beautiful job in the book. We recommend it to everybody. Can you walk through the elements that are described in, in, on page XX on 1.1, figure 1.1? <laughs> I'll do my best. So. Um, we don't ever use the term innovation anymore because it's just such a broad uh, ubric. But there are types of innovation. And some of these innovations are just critical for transforming healthcare. There is one concept called sustaining innovations. And sustaining innovations make good products better. Almost all innovation in healthcare is of that nature, because we're always trying to make good products better so that the caregivers can do more efficacious things. But although those are good, they don't transform the industry. What we need are innovations that are sophisticated technologies that make challenges simple. So for example, Rather than expecting that our hospitals will become cheap, what we need are technologies that enable us to do things in uh, outpatient clinics. The simplest of the things that today we have to address in a hospital. And then we need to drive technology into a clinic so that it can do progressively more sophisticated things. And then we need to bring technology to doctors' offices and then uh, the pharmacies so that they can do the simplest of the things that today you have to address in a clinic and then keep driving the technology so they can do more sophisticated things. And in a similar way, rather than hoping that the specialists will take pay cuts, we need to bring technology to nurses so that they can do the simplest of the things that today a doctor has to do. And then we need to just keep driving technology into the nurses so that they can do progressively more sophisticated things. So innovations that the way you, you help make healthcare affordable and accessible isn't by expecting the expensive ones to become cheap, but rather use technology that simplifies through, through technology so that lower cost venues of care and lower cost care givers can do progressively more sophisticated things. And that's how we make it work in healthcare. And to this time, uh, until we wrote the book at least, we really had very few examples of sophisticated but simplifying innovations that drive uh, costs down. So when you describe disruptive innovation in healthcare, you describe three elements. One is the technology that simplifies. And then the second is economically coherent value networks or a value network. And then the third are low cost innovative business models. Can you describe a facilitated network? Because this is a great concept that most yeah. people really need to understand. You know, when we teach our doctors in medical school how to give care, we teach them as an individual caregiver how to deal with the patient. But what we don't teach them is that you actually have, you're, you're surrounded by processes and structures and, and organization charts and budgets and so on. We don't teach our, our doctors that they're surrounded by this stuff. And what's worse is we have uh, supply chains people who develop and deliver to us uh, uh, drugs and, and devices. And then we have to take care of the doctors or the patients after they leave. And a value network is a group of people before us, in the middle of us, and after us that are coordinated in a way that, that brings costs down. If we think that we as an individual uh, player in the system can make a difference, we're, we're 
miss, miss, we, we don't understand the way the system really works. Then the third element that you describe are the low-cost innovative business models. And I think it's so important for us to understand that the competition within a business model and the importance of new ones. And now we've got uh, paper performance actually happening, so we see the business models changing. Yeah. It's, um, this might be one element of the healthcare system that is resisting change more than others. And um, if you look at what is the cost in a hospital, somewhere around 85% of the cost is in overhead. And overhead exists because the processes of getting things done are not efficient. And so things fall through the crack. You don't know where this has gone to. This takes three much more, three x more time than it has been allotted. And we have all of this overhead structure, and it exists because we don't don't figure out how to make it simple and affordable in a process. And um, and we really need to worry about that. Most hospitals have a sign on the front cover of the hospital that says, you know, guys, it doesn't matter what, what is wrong with you. Bring it in here. We will solve any problem for anybody. And that's what a hospital tries to do. But because we try to do everything for everybody, it's very hard to get overhead costs down. And a, a, a a low-cost business model entails delivering care without all of that overhead. And the way you do that is you focus the hospital to do one or two things very, very well. So that what it means is we need to have fewer general hospitals and more focused hospitals because we, they provide that, um, that the, the they, they, they provide low cost and high quality care. So Clay, everyone has seen the Forbes article about you being the survivor and having these major uh, disease processes and being able to survive them and excel despite them. Uh, you've had a personal experience of the issue of care coordination. And this audience is focused on that, that system failures are a major area where we need innovation and patient safety. Can you address your personal experience? Boy, well, I have had a lot of experience with the healthcare system. In the last 10 years, I've uh, both of my retinas at different points uh, disengaged. Um, I've had type 1 diabetes for 38 years. I had a horrible heart attack about nine years ago, and a year after that I was diagnosed with follicular lymphoma. And then a, a year after that I had a stroke that caused me to, un, to be unable to speak. And, uh, and now I have some systemic problems with my, my nervous system. So um, it's hard to find a, of anybody who have more experience with the healthcare system than me. And I am very grateful for the caregivers that did everything they could to help me. Um, so I don't mean to say, um, to speak in any way disparagingly about how good they are, because they really just killed themselves almost to, to save my life. But um, it's very hard if you're an individual people, an individual caregiver, to coordinate anything, because everything is a one-off. So this patient comes in, he needs this coordination and not that. And so you do that in a one-off. And then another patient comes in and they need different correlate, uh, they, they need to be coordinated with somebody else, you know. And so it's very hard for processes to emerge if you don't ever do anything more than once, you know. And, and that's the challenge in the way we organized 
the delivery of care where if, if the caregivers are independent actors and they get reimbursed by individually care to provide care to the patient, um, they might do a great job individually, but the system doesn't coalesce around a way to do it over and over again at higher, ever, ever higher quality and ever lower cost. And so I, again, I just am so grateful for the caregivers. But boy, I, we have put, put them in a system where uh, the uh, current is going against them in whatever direction they, they swim. So we uh, are so grateful to have, uh, have had Clay speak about disruptive innovation. And we want to remind everyone to, to uh, that we, and we will be sending out invitations to the University of North Texas Health Science Center. We have one of their leaders on as a reactor who was the facilitator, Dr. Diagnostino, who will, uh, who will be a reactor. And when uh, this is posted in full length, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to watch them. Uh, and uh, uh, so this first section about disruptive innovation is the more technical side of what we try to do in every one of our webinars, cover two topics. Uh, and uh, as an introduction to, to Dan Ford, who will now talk about root cause analysis and inviting patients and families in, we want to make sure that we are decoupling the concept of disruptive innovation, although it may be disruptive to some organizations to bring families and, and patients in, which we believe is such an important thing, with this concept of disruptive innovation as a um, as a technique or as an approach to the entire healthcare system. So two topics, uh, and there is kind of a play on words with the reference to disruption, but just want to remind you that uh, Clayton Christensen's full-length uh, talk will be available at the University of North Texas Health Science Center where he went into more and more detail. And I'll close the webinar with just a quick uh, snapshot of what he says uh, about how you will measure your life. So now to shift gears to a, t a second topic and a critically important one, it's a real honor to have Dan Ford, uh, who is a retired healthcare executive, search executive, uh, who has spent many years on both sides of the table. On one hand, he has been relied upon and trusted by our major healthcare systems to find and seek out great uh, leaders who they can hire. So on behalf of those leaders, and then on the other side of the table, representing patients and families along with a, a, a number of patient champion national leaders who are on our reactor panels who meet every other week actually on Saturday mornings to be able to see how they can work together collaboratively uh, and nationally. So it's great to have Dan who developed his deep passion for patient safety as a result of medical errors that were experienced by his first wife. Uh, Diane, which he'll share with you. Um, he went through the other side of the table of being, uh, being with the family involved in a nine-year nine medical malpractice uh, lawsuit. He's given over 80 presentations to boards of directors, management, and physician leadership. He's also served as a patient champion and expert with this wonderful combination of his knowledge of what goes on in the C-suite in the boardroom and as a leader and patient advocate and uh, who I think the Lord has really given an, an amazing voice to for on behalf of our patients and families and has been uh, uh, on committees with HRSA, with, uh, uh, on webinars with CMS on this uh, platform. He's also been on committees with ISMP and served uh, with NQF, the Joint Commission, and a number of healthcare organizations. And although he's retired from his search work, he serves in a very uh, passionate way as an executive patient family advisory council member for a major health system, Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, Michigan. He's also a published author of uh, numerous works uh, in this area of patient safety. And uh, we're just delighted to have Dan be our lead speaker today addressing this issue of involving patients and families in their root cause analysis. I'll let you know that he was a main speaker at the summit in Fort Worth week and a half ago addressing this topic and had such great re reviews that we uh, wanted to give you a chance to hear him speak on this topic. Dan? 
Chuck, thank you. I'm honored to be here and to talk about this, uh, which actually the, the bringing up of the subject has some disruption to it. But it's not why I do it, but over the dozen years that I've really pursued this, I've discovered that. Um, let me start with a quote from Don Berwick. Uh, pardon me, pardon this unwelcome interruption in your life. Thank you for inviting me to help. Thank you for letting me visit. I am your guest and I know it. What may I do for you? Uh, this was included in Don's speech uh, at, at the 2010 Yale Medical School graduation, which his daughter was in that class. And in this quote and, and others in, in that talk, he talks about, he emphasized the fact that the physician is the guest of the patient in this paradigm. That was not the experience that we had and what I'm going to talk about, but I strongly feel this should be our aspiration. And our story is a backdrop for recommending that the patient and family be invited to participate in the request analysis. I've been planting this seed um, for the last 12 years. It's not about me. It's not about my ego. It's not woe is me. It's an unfortunate story about multiple serious medical errors and the significant impact on a wonderful woman in the prime of her life and on her family. And my advocacy mission is about planting seeds of constructive change so others do not have our experience as well as to honor Diane. Okay, here goes. Uh, There's a, a picture of our family a couple years after her hospitalization. Um, the sons Chris and Jonathan, Diane, Sarah, daughter, and yours truly. Okay, in 91, May 1st, Diane went in, who was 47 at the time, went into a Chicago area hospital for what is called a routine hysterectomy. Vibrant woman, loving wife, mother of three, our children were ages 11, 14, and 17 at the time. She was raised in West Tennessee. She was a flight attendant for Pan Am when there was a Pan Am and, and based in San Francisco uh, when we met. Uh, she absolutely loved to learn, has, had a master's degree in education, which she got earlier in her marriage. She was active in church leadership, education, and music. She was a part-time student um, at the time of this hospitalization pursuing a master's in theology uh, from a Cormac Theological Seminary, a Presbyterian Seminary. And again, she absolutely loved to learn and her interest uh, was to be a hospital chaplain. Uh, her colon was cut during the hysterectomy, requiring an immediate another surgery. Uh, Twelve hours later in a room, she overdosed on morphine administered through the PCA pump, uh, through the PCA drip. Narcan was not available at the nurse's station. The code team responded immediately from the emergency department and took over 21 minutes to intubate her, just way too long, uh, to be without oxygen, and she experienced a respiratory arrest, which led to permanent brain damage, permanent short-term memory loss. You can see that there were multiple errors involved in this, as well as the following hospitalizations, pre-hospitalizations and two more surgeries over the next six months, all because of her original procedure. None of these should have happened. In July, the, uh, there was surgery done to reconnect her colon. Uh, in August, I, I think it was about five weeks later, she went back in with a kinked colon, like a hose being kinked. Uh, experienced the delightful uh, go lightly, drinking that for five uh, days in the hospital. Fortunately, no surgery, and for fortunately, it straightened out. Five days later, she discovered bowel in her vagina because of a fistula, a hole that had been caused to happen. Uh, the physician speculated by bowels piercing through or uh, uh, staples left over from the previous surgery. In November, since it didn't heal, there was surgery done to correct the fistula. Staples were discovered during this fourth surgery that had caused the fistula, and obviously those were foreign objects left in her body from her July uh, colon reconnection. Um, my ex the next phase of this was uh, the Ford family, in particular in my experience with risk. And my, my primary uh, contact headed an insurance uh, company affiliated with the State Hospital Association, of which this hospital was a, a member of that, that uh, insurance company. I asked lots of logical questions. I received polite responses at first, and then the defenses went up. I requested a copy of her medical record. I got the copy for $94. I thought that was a bit chintzy, but I bit my tongue. I requested a committee report that debriefed her hospitalizations and medical errors, and the response was, oh, no, that is confidential. Again, I asked and added that Diane has permanent brain damage, and the response kind of exasperated was, same response, it's confidential. It was clear <clears throat> that I was not invited or wanted in that space, and that discourse was so offensive that just to, to this day it just sticks in my mind. It undoubtedly led to my patient safety advocacy, including my persistent to cause analysis journey. This is what it felt like. Keep out, no trespassing. That's not a very good feeling when, when you understand but don't understand the dynamics involved. 
Um, the risk manager's attitude was, we know best, star your wife has brain damage, that happens. The mixture of arrogance and sensitivity, condescension, gruffness, and the other characteristics. Um, and and I, I'm a Christian, I think positive about people by nature, but this guy was just so difficult to deal with. So I, uh, these, these terms are what I would describe. Um, he stated his role was to save the hospital money. The hospital was not philanthropic and would not give away money. Told me this on several occasions, made, made sure I got that. His wife was his key associate, in, which is an interesting management principle. She was a nurse. She was a very, very nice lady. And clearly it was bad cop, good cop. I initiated all meetings and I always felt like it was being pushed into a black hole, wishing we would just go away. Um, after 21 months of very frustrating dialogue with with this man, the past administration and the physicians, a final meeting with risk was held absent the risk manager, who interestingly enough was sick. Interestingly enough, the meeting was not rescheduled. His wife conducted the meeting. She was clearly very uh, uncomfortable. Uh, a, a financial settlement after some small talk was offered, and uh, we turned it down. And she told me that. Basically, they were covering our risks. She said, we estimate this is what it's going to be to, cost, to cover our legal expenses. Uh, Diane was permanently brain damaged, was and is permanently brain damaged, permanent short-term memory loss, she'll never work again, and was a very poor quality of life. We were treated poorly by this risk manager. He had no empathy or the concept, as Don Brewer would suggest, that caregivers are the visitors, the guests, privileged to be helping patients. This paradigm should not only be just at the bedside. Okay, uh, we filed a medical malpractice lawsuit, uh, and two months later after that, uh, someone offered was doubled, extended to us. We turned that down. Uh, defense attorneys successfully delayed the lawsuit for nine years, including three changes in judges, so they obviously had to go through a learning curve. Um, Diane lost interest. She quit the lawsuit in 2002, and we settled for a very, very nominal amount. All Diane wanted was a brain that worked. Uh, she could no longer uh, continue to handle the revisiting of what happened to her brain, her life, her family, her future. She didn't remember details anyway. My take on this is defense attorneys delay and delay successfully. The patient and family wears down, just goes away or dies. They were right and those attorneys won. However, it was not right, nor did it fit the spirit of medicine. Today, uh, Diane lives in an independent living facility in Tennessee. Uh, we were divorced in 1997. Uh, brain damage does awful things to a person, and who knows how any of us uh, would respond if, if our life was turned upside down like that. Each of our lives was turned upside down, each of our family, although not obviously not in the same way, but it was, it was very impactful. One of my prayers in 91 was that Chris, Jonathan, and Sarah not awaken in 10 years with serious psychological problems, and each are doing okay, we are close, we are friends. Uh, we have seven adorable grandchildren, um, and when you have the bully pulpit like this, you can talk about your grandchildren all you want, and they're wonderful. Uh, they live in Michigan, Tennessee, and Alabama. Okay, the way the hospital, this is my assessment in hindsight, the way the hospital and physicians managed this was callous, disrespectful, and unprofessional. I'm positive and optimistic by nature and my faith, as I mentioned earlier. They knew better, and they could have done better. I believe that. Their behavior was guided by money and lack of leadership, backbone, and courage. Their priorities were messed up. The hospital's priorities were messed up. I forgave right away, but I did want to see behavior change, and that's why I do my patient safety advocacy. Um, Ashram invited me. Ashram was kind of a lifesaver for me. It, it, it just described the relationship with this risk manager, and Ashram being the National Organization of Managers, Billy with AHA, invited me to serve in a special task force on patient safety in 2002 and three and to co-present at the annual meeting in Nashville in 2003. To a person, um, and, and this is collectively what I got from this group, Dan, we have too many medical errors. You have industry visibility. We need to hear your family medical error story. It will help us to change. This encouragement from a group of wonderful risk managers was the start of my advocacy journey. It was a lonely journey until then. The folks in our industry who could do something genuinely cared, and to this day I appreciate that. My advocacy triggers, and this is kind of a summary of what I've gone through, but Diane's medical errors, 
uh, the impact on Diane and her family and the caregivers, lack of respect for our family, the arrogant attitude of the risk manager, denial of that committee report that I mentioned earlier, lack of leadership backbone and courage, the hospital's messed up priorities, um, the one-sided nature of all my conversations with those folks. Our nine-year medical malpractice lawsuit that came to an abrupt conclusion, and then the 1999 IOM report to air as human. I retired in 2013 from 36 years in healthcare executive search where I recruited uh, CEOs, uh, board members, others in the C-suite, and, and most of this was for hospitals and systems. And during that time, framed my bias for recruiting executives and board members included a passion for patient safety. In retirement, my advocacy continues. The subject that we're talking about today, and that's inviting the patient and the family to participate in their RCA, and, the, and I emphasize the word invite. Um, it's been a 12-year journey. I've been an outspoken proponent of providers inviting the patient and the family to participate in, the, in their root cause analysis. Um, and the three, summarizing this, uh, is the three parts basically is the investigative part. Uh, the analysis and discussion, and the action plan development. Clearly, this is a hot potato, and that's why when I first started earlier, I, I used the word disruption because a lot of people don't want to hear about, about my suggestion. But any hospital which purports to be transparent and support patient and family engagement but does not invite the patient and the family to participate in their RC is disingenuous, in my opinion. It just doesn't connect. I wrote an article in, about, on this subject in December 2013 that was in Dorland Health's uh, online journal. Uh, what are the barriers and, and the reticence? Uh, top of the list, I think probably are physician fears of lawsuit, uh, loss of practice and income. I've been had that stated a number of times. Uh, the pol related pol politics and power gradients and the condescending attitudes by too many. Uh, providers deciding that no, the patient and the family members will not understand the language involved, so therefore they should be invited rather than explaining to them when they are in the room. Uh, we've not done that before and we don't do things that way. Um, the physician's fear of loss, oops, excuse me. Uh, expectations of finding patient involvement awkward and threatening. Uh, fear of openness, candor, and emotions. I've had several people tell me we're afraid the doctor may start crying in the presence of the patient and the family. My response is, oh, darn. Um, caregivers intimidated by legal counsel risk, the chief medical officer and or chief executive officer resistance. Lack of board support, a lack of backbone and courage, and state laws impacting peer review and others that uh, those participating here today can add to this list. Here's, uh, somebody sent this to me a while back, I think it was on Facebook, uh, and this is unfortunately the perceptive perspective by too many patients and family members, and you can read that for yourself. Um, what are the benefits to patient participation? I think it's the right thing to do when you follow your true north, as Bill George talked about on the DMIT webinar a month or two ago, uh, when you know your, your, what you're about, your values, your faith helps, uh, what are the rules? You know, in our heart, in our gut, we know what's the right thing to do. Uh, benefits are it will also break down walls or prevent walls from being built following a sentinel event, preventable harm, be a continuation of the partnership that starts in the physician office and the hospital. I think it's a good business. P people typically sue because of the way they are treated. Yes, there are, there are opportunists that will always sue, but I think that's a minority. Uh, it has to do with the way people are treated. Uh, it can raise the bar for true patient-centered care, partnership, engagement, and transparency. It can contribute to a just culture. A patient and family can validate caregiver behavior if and when the behavior is questioned, behavior by a caregiver is questioned, or challenged by egos or by bullying. Um, it will demonstrate patient leadership and his or her comments and suggestions are pertinent and constructive. And it demonstrates caring when the patient, the family comforts a caregiver in the in the root cause analysis. I would suggest the first person to uh, go over and give a hug to that doctor who may have some tears. Our nurse will be the patient of the family. It may prevent a lawsuit. It may not. It will contribute to healing for all. It can contribute to justice for all. It can contribute to learning the patient. Sometimes a family member is the common thread 
through the entire patient experience. Mm -hmm. And it is mindfulness that's role modeled by the patient and the family. Just a little sidebar here that mindfulness is a very key part of hospitals that are on high reliability organization journeys for everyone to notice the unexpected and, and to be preoccupied with the smallest failures or unexpected occurrences. And this came to me from Ann Bluen, uh, who's with the Joint Commission for a presentation I gave two years ago. Again, on the mindfulness, the patient and the family can frequently spot the unexpected, part of an informal check and balance. We're preoccupied with failures or we notice the unexpected occurrences. Typically, we have a questioning and a curious attitude. We watch and notice everything because at that time, uh, it's all about us, and that's what we notice. It, I know that we can sometimes drive bedside staff nuts, and I'm sure, but but please take us seriously. Please respect us. Hurting patients are less concerned about being politically, politically correct. We just want safe care and to know the truth, what really happened. It's the beginning of healing. Uh, this uh, quote comes from Terry Zimmerman and, and Jerry Moore, Moore in an article they wrote, uh, for the Ashram Journal in 2008. They're both very well-known and well-regarded in the Ashram world. Um, uh, both are risk managers. Terry is also an attorney, and, and Jerry has been a consultant. I think Terry has been, too. Um, if done well, patient inclusion is in the system analysis process will not only encourage more accurate investigative findings, but can also help involve healthcare providers and patients and their families to begin the healing process in a positive and effective manner. I can imagine a caregiver being involved in such an event and having to go for the rest of their life because somebody in the organization or somebody says, no, you're not going to have any connection at all, any dialogue with the patient and the family that's involved. That's just plain cruel, in my opinion. And there I'm talking about the caregivers in addition to the patients and the family members. Uh, uh, the, the National Patient Safety Foundation put out a report uh, in June about this subject, about uh, not only just the patient and the family piece of it, but uh, upgrading the whole event. And they put on a webinar in July that Jim Mason and Doug Bonacom, um, uh presented, uh, uh, went through the presentation in PowerPoint slides. RCA is actually RCA squared, and this old guy doesn't know how to do that on his keyboard. Um, but um, the root cause analysis, <clears throat> there's actually, there typically are more than one causes in the analysis. The purpose of the event is, is the action plan. So you got a couple, at least a couple of A's, you got the, you got the C's, and so they creatively came up with RCA squared. Okay, I'm sharing the following two July 15th webinar slides with the approval of the uh, joint, uh, the, the National Patient Safety Foundation. These are the two slides. I'm going to start with the, uh, the team members. Um, uh, they recommend a minimum or uh, limited uh, membership, which they call voting membership, of four to six team members. Nothing magic about the four to six. It could be seven. But they recommend four to six versus 15 or 20. Uh, this is work, and a small team can be much more nimble. Uh, people with fundamental knowledge of the subject area and the RCA process trying to minimize the conflict of interest, and it should not include those who are part of the event. Team leader should be an experienced and skilled leader. Uh, the role of the patient and the family, this is key, and this is why these recommendations are good. Um, they recommend that a, that a PFAC member, a patient representative, be one of the voting members on this team of four to six people, and that the involved patient and family does not have a role but is not on the team uh, not a formal role on the team, not a voting member. Issues to consider here are the ability and willingness to participate, as well as psychological and legal barriers. OK. Um, my comments on this is I agree that those involved in the event be invited to be interviewed about the, by, about the event, caregivers and patient loved ones. Keyword is invited. Some are starting to do this. Some have been doing this for a while. Again, keyword is invited. And my additional recommendation is that caregivers and the patient loved one be invited to participate in the analysis and discussion um, and, in the, and in the action plan development by the team, though not necessarily as voting members of the team. Again, the keyword is invited. Again, when you follow your true, true north, you do what is right. Um, this structure and involvement lends itself to removing walls, learning, sharing the truth, to healing and learning, and to good business. 
Uh, if you've seen one RCA, I understand you've seen one RCA. Uh, my suggestion is to put this process, if you've got a process improvement program, uh, a serious process improvement program, to put an update of your RCA through this um, uh, is such an event and include this consideration of involving the patient and the family in the RC as part, RC as part of this. As I speak, I am participating in Spectrum Health in such a lean process improvement event in which the RCA um, is, is being updated as well as we uh, have under consideration, including the voice of the, well, the voice of the patient on the team as well as the patient and the family uh, participation that's undergoing consideration. Healing, heart of the journey, Jerry and Terry mentioned that a few minutes, I referred to that a few minutes ago, healing doesn't mean the damage never existed, it means the damage no longer controls your life. Uh, this is a rather uh, dark humor from my naval aviation days going way back. It was funny then, um, uh, it's not funny now, and as, as I incorporate it into this very serious uh, presentation. Uh, and I, say, I ask, please don't bail out on us. Don't shut us out. Don't lie to us or, and or treat us as invisible. We're already hurting. Uh, and, and please get out of your comfort zone to do this. Please get out of your comfort zone. Please include us even in these difficult discussions about our medical error event. event. Deborah Simmons, uh, who lives in Texas <clears throat> and is a friend of mine, she's a nurse, she's very active in her PhD. She's on the faculty of the University of Texas School of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, informatics, and her quote is here, the trust of the patient is sacred. We are truly in a place that is rare when a patient puts their trust in us. Uh, Lucian Leap suggests the lack of respect is the most important issue in health care. I think the patients and families and providers want and deserve to be treated as respected human beings in a caring, trusting, and nurse in a transparent partnership, all of us. We each hurt when harm happens, everybody involved. John F. Kennedy suggested that one person can make a difference and everyone should try and wholeheartedly endorse that. Last slide here is I think attitude is the biggest barrier. For years we've convinced ourselves we cannot involve patients and families in RCAs. Again, I say get out of your comfort zone. It's about control and it's not about patient engagement. It's not yet the culture that Don Berwick suggests. I believe we have a shift in attitude taking place, as Jim Bajan noted to the inter communication exchange, he said, the work ahead is to get the approaches into practice. We can do this. Let's do it together. I appreciate your listening, and very quickly, again, when you got the bully pulpits, you can put slides up of your kids and your grandkids, and I'm not going to dwell on these, but this is why I do what I do. This is uh, to honor them as well as Diane. Um, and uh, so the generation uh, that's coming up and generations after that don't experience this. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, there are slides following this that I used in another presentation. I'm not going to go into the presentation I did for the Oregon Patient Safety uh, Commission. I think would be very helpful for participants' own discussion and for some um, for, for group meetings. Please contact me if you choose with any questions or suggestions or criticism. I would, I would invite and welcome that. Chuck, thank you very much, and back to you. Well, thank you, Dan. Really excellent job. And uh, I think that uh, we're, we're seeing the progress uh, now where this was just a completely bizarre idea that no one wanted to entertain. But we, you know, I think you very properly included references of those that are in the risk management field. And we're slowly seeing things move. So uh, as we get to our polling uh, here shortly, which we'll, we'll, we'll be doing, we're going to ask you some questions regarding root cause analysis and your need for tools and, and more case studies and, and that kind of thing. But I'd like to shift gears just for a moment. And our first reactor is Dr. Uh, Christopher Peabody. Dr. Toff uh, Peabody is, uh, is an emergency medicine doctor uh, at UCSF, recently appointed an assistant clinical professor, has worked with us over the last seven years, uh, is uh, an incredible uh, speaker. Uh, I think he'll be one of our leading uh, people in the world on health information technology patient safety issues. And Dr. Dr. Peabody will be leading uh, our community of practice on health information technologies. Um, he'll re he heard Dan speak uh, in Fort Worth, and he'll also add some uh, other dimensions that he'd like to uh, uh, contribute to before we uh, go to Dr. Diagnostino. So um, 
Kyle, would you please play the recording of Dr. Peabody? He's on a shift today, and he didn't want to miss uh, being able to address this audience, and so we pre-recorded uh, his comments in reaction. Chuck, thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be back in one of your webinars. Now, Dan Ford and I, I were both presenters at a conference two weeks ago, and this was a conference on innovation in patient safety at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Now, the University of North Texas Health Science Center is actually creating a patient safety institute. This is one of the first of its kind, and it really focuses on patient safety innovations. Now, this conference was one of the kickoff events for this new institute, and I was happy to be part of it. And it was just incredible to be around people like Dan who are really creating and dedicating their lives to patient safety innovations. Now, as I listened to many of the speakers at the conference, two themes started to emerge, and I want to just focus on those really quickly. The first theme was that most of the patient safety innovations that are coming down the pipeline have to do with working in teams. The model of healthcare delivery is really changing, and it's changing rapidly. No longer are we just going to one physician and having that family physician take care of all of our complex medical needs. Healthcare is happening in teams, and they're happening in multidisciplinary teams. Each member of that team has their own expertise, and we're starting to celebrate that expertise. But as we start to work more and more in teams, we also have to focus on workflow, teamwork, and how that team is going to act as a high reliability organization so that we keep our patients safe. Many of the patient safety innovations that were presented at this conference had to do with how to integrate this team into the existing medical structure so that we can take care of patients safely, appropriately, and with a high level of care and compassion. Now, at the conference, we discussed how we're actually training our healthcare workforce to work in teams. And one of the solutions that was proposed was to actually start by training in multidisciplinary teams. So much of our training process is siloed. We don't have adequate training before we're supposed to be leading or participating in teams to take care of patients in real time. So I really, really enjoyed hearing about how to integrate the healthcare workforce in teams. Now, there was a great talk by Mary Foley that talked about team-based care that included the patient. And I think this gets to what Dan was talking about today. As healthcare leaders in patient safety, we need to start integrating the patients in everything we do. This is from the clinical care teams as a patient being a member of that clinical care team and having a voice and making decisions, shared decision-making with every aspect of that care that's being provided to them. And then also with what Dan was talking about today, when things do go wrong, when mistakes are made, when medical errors occur, when patient safety is threatened, when we actually perform a root cause analysis to figure that out so it doesn't happen again, we need the patient's perspective. This is incredibly valuable. How are we supposed to learn how patients feel in these situations how can we make their experience better if they're not a member of that team? And so I really commend Dan and what he was talking about, not only at the conference, but also today on the webinar. Patients need to be part of teams. Now we're slowly starting to see the integration of patients into healthcare teams throughout medical practice. And one of the ways that we've really been able to see this that's had great impact on patient safety is in my field of expertise, which is in health information technology. We're starting to share the electronic health record with patients. Now, if patients are able to go over that electronic health record, review their own labs, review their medications, review the thought process of the physician by reading those notes that physicians communicate with each other, we've actually found that bringing the patients on as part of the team actually helps catch medical errors before they even start. We actually see that they're more integrated in the patient care plan. And who's better to have more interest in the care of the patient than the patient themselves? 
Dan, as I listen to the story that you've shared with us today about the multiple medical errors that happened in the care of your wife during a quote-unquote routine hysterectomy, I see many opportunities for where integrating the patient into shared decision-making and integrating the patient advocate, which in this case probably would have been you, Dan, could have helped save some of these unfortunate outcomes that happened to your wife and that are now happening around the country as we speak. Dan, I'm completely on board with integrating patients into root cause analysis. I think it's a necessary idea, and I think it's a, one of these disruptive innovations that Clay Christensen talked about. In fact, this idea is so great, I think we can even go further. I think patients need to be integrated up front so that we can prevent some of these errors from happening. And I gave the example of giving the patient access to their electronic health record so that they can actually review what's been going on with them and help prevent errors and help clarify patient care plans. But this needs to happen in real time. Patients need to be integrated into the healthcare team. They need to be active members. Their voice needs to be heard during the development of the patient care plan. And so I think integrating patients on rounds and seeing all the complex decisions that go into taking care of every single patient in a hospital, they need to be privy to that as well. We work really, really hard to do the right thing for patients. Let's integrate them into that decision-making process. Let's show them that compassion. Let's show them the amount of attention that we're actually giving them by integrating patients into the daily rounds at every hospital. I think that is going to be one of the biggest disruptive innovations in patient safety that we're going to see in the next 10 years, integrating patients into the healthcare workforce. So uh, we are so privileged to have Toph be a uh, contributor, and you're, you, you, you've heard a sample of his, uh, his leadership and thoughtfulness. Now to shift to another physician before we have our patient advocate champions react as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Agnostino is uh, the chairman of the Department of Medicine at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. He's an associate professor of internal medicine. His uh, responsibilities are focusing on both clinical and academic lives of the physicians and providers. Uh, he most recently was the facilitator and provocateur and master of ceremonies at this leading innovation in patient safety uh, summit that actually had speakers from CDC uh, by video and uh, invitations were out to all 600 of the evaluation centers for Ebola as well as the 55 treatment centers. And Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. D was also one of the great uh, uh, communicators of what was going on during uh, during the Ebola issue that that occurred in the in the DFW, the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, and really uh, was a great communicator of what was going on there. Uh, Darren, would you like to share your thoughts uh, regarding the summit and also what Dan presented today? And then we'll go next to uh, Jenny Dingman, and we'll uh, have all our reactors react. Great. Thanks, Chuck. I really appreciate being here. And uh, once again, hearing everybody's conversation about patient safety is just, uh, it, it's an incredible uh, step forward for uh, patient care. Um, I do have a couple of comments. Uh, first, I'd love to um, really thank everybody that uh, participated at the University of North Texas Health Science Center Patient Safety Summit. This was actually the launching of our Patient Safety Institute, which is really uh, part of the vision of our leadership uh, with Mike Williams, um, excuse me, Mike Williams at the helm. Um, he's a very, very visionary and driven leader, and uh, basically we feel that we're healing patients with safety. And I think this is a great thing. Uh, putting these um, these talks and uh, webinars together really helps us focus our attention. I think one of the things that came up while I was listening for the second time to Dan Ford uh, was that the the biggest issue was communication. Communication is a two-way street. You have to give information. You have to receive information. And nobody was receiving his or Diane's information. Nobody was taking it in 
and saying we need to do something for these patients. And you have a very highly educated consumer who was trying to elicit information to help his family and help move the healing process forward, and it just didn't make it. I think part of this is going to go back to uh, one of my summary comments, which is essentially what we're dealing with is emotional intelligence and what we need to start focusing on as we're training our future physicians is the concept of emotional intelligence and the ability to move through information, not in a defensive way, but in a learning way. The second thing is actually something that uh, Toth just spoke about, and he talked about teams. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, as you mentioned, I cross over two different areas of healthcare. I am very deeply in academics, and I teach at the University of North Texas, as well as uh, run clinical programs. And one of the new curricula that we're putting together is actually one that is exactly this. It's team-based learning. It's a layered and uh, tiered learning that allows us to um, take all of the players on a care team and teach them about the specific task and procedural competence that they need in order to function in the team. This does include communication. It includes being able to communicate with team members as well as uh, as well as patients. Uh, one of the things that we're working very um, hard and fast on here is something called mobile, um, mobile um, um, health care, which essentially is bringing the patient-centered home to the patient's home. And as we start to integrate health care with these team members, we're finding that the students are loving the fact that they can see how their teammates can help uh, move patient care through the system. Uh, so this is something that's very new. We just put our first cohort through uh, through the first rotation, and we're actually looking forward to reporting on this in the future. And I'll be discussing some of this data with you also, Chuck, to uh, see how it how it connects. Overall, I think uh, our launch of the Patient Safety Institute at the University of North Texas was uh, was an amazing event. Uh, we're looking forward to next year's with a lot of the same national and international experts. Um, we would love to have Dan come back and keep giving us a report on how integrating patients into the care team is, uh, and the root cause analysis is moving forward, and we want to be able to help as best we can in order to make that happen. Uh, with that, I'll shift back to you, Chuck. Thank you. Thanks so much, Darren. And if we have time, we'll come back to you again. I just wanted to, uh, before I uh, uh, introduce uh, Jenny Dingman, I wanted to make sure our polling questions were up for you because we'd like to hear from you. And the first question is, I need a tactical action plan and practices to include patients and families in RCAs at my organization. Now, uh, go ahead and score this on a 1 to 10. Very strongly agree is a 10. 1 is very strongly disagree. Now, if you do not have a role at your organization, either formal or informal, where you would do that. If you're at an organization where that doesn't occur, click on not applicable to me, just so that we can really get a good read from those of you of our audience who do have a role in one way or another. This means that you, your role might be far beyond uh, risk management as a patient safety officer, as a chief nursing officer, even as a staff person who would be willing to know more to be able to uh, get this done great, but if you're not at, a, at an organization where care is delivered and where RCAs occur, click not a, a, applicable to me. The second question is, with proper tools and successful examples, I would propose to include patients and families and RCAs at my organization. Again, this is an anonymous poll, but what we're trying to find out is, if we were to provide those to you, some drill down details, some best practices, some success stories, uh, of those that have tried it and succeeded, tried and failed, and we were able to get the tools to you, would you be willing to propose that process at your organization, basically taking the, the, the risk off of your back and be providing you with a toolbox that, that you could just introduce so that you would not be at risk? And then the second two questions are, I need actionable best practices to reduce misdiagnosis at my organization. We, this was our first topic we covered in, our, in the news. And the second question is, I would like a webinar dedicated to the reduction of misdiagnoses. 
So this is this whole area which we know is going to land squarely in the chief quality officer's lap, risk manager's laps, um, uh, and patient safety officers. So those two questions are about diagnosis. And, um, and then the two free text uh, questions are topics regarding misdiagnosis I want covered. So give us those, anything you know, that you think is important. We know that emergency medicine diagno misdiagnoses are enormous. But any topic you want covered, put the free text entry and type it in. And then the free text entry on topics regarding bringing patients and families into their RCA include. We'd love to hear from you. And then we'll meet your needs by, uh, by putting on, a, on another webinar if we get a great response to address those issues. Uh, I wanted to get those teed up first before we uh, move to Jenny Dingman. Jenny is well known to uh, this audience because she's spoken n numerous times. What you don't know about Jenny is she's a steadfast champion, quiet champion all across the country helping patients and families. Uh, she is tires tire tirelessly always uh, helping them. She's also been a co-author with the other reactors, both Becky and Arlene, uh, in the medical literature and a co-author of the Safe Practices, uh, Chapter 9 in the Safe Practices. Uh, she has served with HRSA and multiple federal agencies representing patients and families. And, and so, uh, Jenny, I know you're a, you're a great supporter of Dan and this, uh, this concept. Uh, your reaction, and then we'll go to Arlene and then to Becky. Thank you so much, Dr. Denham, for having me here today. Um, Dan, I, I can't thank you enough for bringing the attention to this very, very important subject matter. What happened to Diane was just so terrible, what happened to your family, and, and I just applaud your hard work and the dedication that you have given to this cause for such a long time. Had they just listened to you and your family, everything could have been so different than it is right now. It's just so unfortunate. Uh, with regard to root cause analysis, I think that it's very, very important that patients and families are included. From the beginning to the end, from the cradle to the grave, I believe that when a patient goes into a hospital or any healthcare setting, their safety needs to be just as important as the illness or the disease that they're being treated for. The safety is just as big of an issue, and I think it's just so important that we incorporate the patient and the family member or the advocate that's there representing the patient to be a voice for that patient and to be heard by the rest of the team, to be a member of the team. But before that happens, providers must welcome us all to that table. And unfortunately, we're still not there yet. But I have to move on to applaud Dr. Peabody for what he's doing as an emergency room physician. Emergency room physicians really get it. These guys are right down there and gals when people are in their absolute worst scenarios. And it's very imperative that they listen to the patient and the family. And these people know this. And I think not only must we listen to the patient and family, but we, we must listen to the emergency room staff and doctors about engaging patients and families once they move them upstairs to other parts of the hospital. Um, I, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Peabody, for pioneering this and, and your dream team. It was just an honor to meet you and everyone in Texas. And Dr. D. August, Augustino, I hope I have your name right. I, what you're doing is groundbreaking, and you're going to lead our country into the 21st century to change things. I was just so honored and humbled to meet each and every one of you down in Fort Worth. And the great work that you're doing and the lessons that you've learned from mistakes and what you've done with it, it, it just warms my heart so much. I can't thank you enough. Um, and what I'd like to say, Dr. Denham, thank you for these webinars because they are saving lives and they're making a difference. And for everyone who's listening today, please, everything that was said today on this webinar is very, very, very important. It's one of the most important webinars that we've ever had because this is a new century. This is a new world. And, and, and this disruptive innovation is really, really important. We need to use the patient and the family and the advocates representing those people to be part of the healthcare team, like I said before, to make the jobs of the people taking care of them easier. Um, thank you very, very much, and God bless everyone. Dr. Denham, I'll turn it back to you and the others. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, man, just a great uh, impassioned uh, 
set of thoughts that are terrific. And uh, I want to just uh, mention that Jenny, Arlene, Mary Foley, who was not on but mentioned, Dan Ford, uh, uh, were all uh, speakers. Becky couldn't make it. She'll be speaking in a minute. Uh, but uh, And I know that they'll all be back at the next summit. And this is uh, groundbreaking in that this is the first summit that had this many patient advocate champions in leadership roles. They got to help design this summit and uh, were main speakers at this summit. So moving to Arlene again, the things I said about uh, Jenny are all true. And Arlene has a specific set of experiences and is a tireless champion on the issue of bullying in the healthcare uh, uh, system uh, where uh, power is misused and where uh, many of the, uh, the, the, the traumatic things that happen to caregivers, which we addressed in our red cover reports a couple of months ago, uh, uh, can really be brought out. And she is tirelessly focused on helping us uh, uh, with this issue, which we'll be covering more in future. But Arlene, uh, your reactions to what you heard? Uh, first, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, being here, and I want to thank Dan for sharing his story. Uh, I think looking at Dan's story, uh, we all have common elements uh, in our own story, too. And the way I feel is accidents are going to happen, nothing's perfect, and um, let's say any kind of accident, putting the facts is vital to understanding what went wrong and to identify the steps we could take to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I'll tell you, patients think differently. We have a different perspective. Uh, what's making routine to the healthcare givers is not routine to us. Um, after a medical error, I think patients and their families' input is critical to understanding the whole picture. And a lot of times that is, um, it does happen, there's a lack of communication or uh, not being listened to. Um, you could get all the facts and data down on paper, but if that patient doesn't relay that information, say, hey, nobody listened to me, then that's data that is left out. So we cannot be left out. Just like any witness to any accident, any medical mistake, um, we need to be included. And we need to be included in our own uh, RCAs because it makes sense and it's the right thing to do. And we have a lot to offer. I know it may be a complicated um, issue to establish a, a, a form how this could be done, but I have great confidence in the medical community. So uh, thank you, Dr. Dunham. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And Arlene, I just want to take a minute to have you address the issues that pertain to the long-term care facilities where so many of our patients are transferred. and and the value of people like you that were on the floor that may not have been directly delivering a therapeutic dose of medicine, but I know over the years, the last seven years of working with you, you identified so many things as, as, a, as a, in your services where you could help patients with eating, eating and other things that were really critical patient safety issues when people have swallowing problems and others. Do you want to just address the long-term care facilities quickly and then we'll go to Becky? I think, I think it's very important in long-term care. If there's a lot of turnover going on, there's something wrong with your environment. And I think uh, the better environment, the happier employee, the happier and the safer resident. So I think we really need to take a, a look at how uh, that environment is. If, it's, if the caregiver is invited to point out uh, risk problems, potential risk problems, not only to the residents, but there's also risk to the caregiver. And if they're invited and they're um, kind of received in a, in a constructive way, in a team way, uh, as an as a equal team member, I think the uh, healthcare uh, facility will improve. And uh, quality will be better, more money, you know, with more, more patients coming in. And I think everybody wins. Thank you, Arlene. I'll move to Becky, and uh, and then we're going to sh play a short video or audio of uh, Clayton Christensen on the concept of how you will measure your life uh, before going back to Darren and then to Becky to close. So, Becky, on the topics, this isn't your closing comments, but I'd like to have you react to what you heard, and then uh, and then we'll tee up uh, the uh, the short audio of um, of Clayton Christensen and then to Darren. 
So Becky, your comments on what you heard today. Uh, I'll, I'll speak um, regarding Dan Ford's presentation. And Dan was so eloquent in sharing his experience. What I would add is from the perspective of surviving family members and how that experience may be different when the patient um, is deceased. When you're sitting with the family, take pause and consider that they have lost not only their loved one, but also their soft place to land. If the open arms you run to that hold you, support you, that embrace you, if they were suddenly gone, imagine being the family and sitting there in the room with you, looking for answers, needing answers, and to know, to have to face the realization that when, late, uh, when they leave the meeting, they will be returning to an empty home without their loved one, without their soft place to land. My hope is that all of you have a soft place to land on those challenging days, those moments that have fallen short of perfection. And my ask is that you take pause and you choose how you respond to the family to mirror what you yourself would need if the roles were reversed. You have the influence to soften their fall. Chuck, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Kyle, will you play the short clip of uh, Clay regarding how you'll measure your life? Clay, your book, How Will You Measure Your Life, has been so inspirational to so many of us, and I think it really applies to those of us that are looking for the new next great career adventure, as well as people that are in organizations today, and kids starting out. Can you share the, the, share the concept with us? Yeah, it's hard for me to come up with any other measure than have I spent my life trying to help individual people to become better people. And, uh, and that's the way I decide that God will measure my life. Um, because he doesn't count. He doesn't count how many people reported to me in a company, you know. But rather, he just wants to talk to me about the people who I help to become better people. And every day, that's what I try to do, is to try and find somebody who, can I, help, who I could help to become a better person because of their interact, interaction with me. I'm really grateful that I, I've had that insight. So I recommend that you read this book. This was a book that came from Clay's speech to a graduating class of MBAs at Harvard when he was standing at the podium after having chemotherapy for his stage three cancer. And he talked about how you'd measure your, your life. And it ultimately was so moving to this class of this MBA class that it became a book and we highly recommend it. It factors beautifully with what a, a lot of what Dan had said about doing the right thing and uh, a really, really wonderful book uh, and we highly recommend it. So what I'd like to do is just take the next 30 seconds to have uh, Darren, your thoughts regarding where we're heading and then uh, refer back to Becky for closing thoughts. So Darren, uh, could you share and then to Becky. Great. Thanks, Chuck. Um, yeah, I think uh, where we're heading is going to require us to have three things in mind. What our roles are going to be in the future, how those roles are going to define our responsibilities, and lastly, the growth of emotional intelligence in all of the members of those teams. I think as we start to put this together, we start to realize that we have to rely on each other. And quite frankly, the reason most of us are clinicians and taking care of people who are ill is because we want to help others. And we have to include those people who are the patients in our growth and improvement. And I think we're on the path now. As we talk about it, the first step is really to bring those words out into the public and have everybody start to hear them. I'll turn it over to you, Chuck. Thank you very much, Darren. And, and you mentioned Dr. Uh, Dr. Williams, who has just been an enormously successful 
a physician, a former CEO of a hospital that won Baldridge, went from number 4,000 to number one in the country uh, in, in the face of enormous financial pressures and now the leader of your uh, university uh, who has really been able, been able to have the courage to take on a lot of these crises. So we're really proud to have you here and we look forward to having the enduring content be available to us and we'll announce that uh, to, in our next webinar. Uh, so I turn it over to Becky. We've covered a lot of ground, and, and, and Becky, would you just close us and keep us focused on our patients and families? And uh, thank you all. God bless all of you, and we'll see you in December. Go ahead, Becky. Uh, thank you to the team at TMIT, to Dan Ford, Professor Christensen, Drs. Peabody and Augustino, for the wisdom and leadership that you have graced us with, and to each of you attending the webinar today for your tireless energy, efforts, and resources for the work that you do each and every day to advance patient safety. I'll close with words of affirmation. When you're near the end of your workday and as you're walking out the door, you ask yourself, have I made a difference today? When you have the right people doing the right things, you get the right results for your patients. You have made a difference. The result is that today at your organization, someone is bringing their someone, their everything, home. What does that mean for patients and families? It means that our families remain intact. Birthday candles will be blown out. High school graduations will be attended. There will be dance recitals, home runs, new marriages, new babies, and Christmas presents tucked underneath the trees. That's all to be celebrated. Thank you so much, Becky. As always, you are just so thoughtful. We'll end our webinar, and I'd like the speakers to stay on if they could so we can do a performance improvement loop and uh, see what we can do better next time. Uh, take care. We'll see you in December.